Thank you, Counsel. Mr. Clement? Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, Florida's effort to level the playing field and to fight the perceived bias of big tech violates the First Amendment several times over. It interferes with editorial discretion, it compels speech, it discriminates on the basis of content, speaker, and, view and viewpoint. And it does all this in the name of promoting free speech, but loses sight of the first principle of the First Amendment, which is it only applies to state action. Florida defends its law, as you've heard this morning, principally by insisting that there's no expressive activity being regulated. That blinks reality. This statute defines the targeted websites in part by how big their audience is. It regulates the content and display of particular websites, and it tries to prevent my clients from censoring speakers and content. If you are telling the websites that, you are sense that they can't censor speakers, you can't turn around and say you're not regulating expressive activity. It's all over this law. And that brings it squarely within the teaching of Tornillo, PG&E, and Hurley. All three of those cases teach that you cannot have the forced dissemination of third-party speech, and they reject considerations of market power, misattribution, or space constraints. And Reno and 303 Creative make clear those principles are fully applicable on the Internet. Indeed, given the vast amount of material on the Internet in general and on these websites in particular, exercising editorial discretion is absolutely necessary to make the websites useful for users and advertisers. And the closer you look at Florida's law, the more problematic the First Amendment problems become. It singles out particular websites in plain violation of Minneapolis Star. It's provisions that give preferences to political candidates and to, edit and to journalistic enterprises are content-based in the extreme. I welcome the Court's questions. Uh, Mr. Clement, if the government did what your clients uh, are doing, uh, or um, would that be government speech? So it might be government speech, but I think it would be unconstitutional government speech, which is to say when the government, I mean, you know, obviously you have government speech cases, but when, what the government's doing is exercising editorial discretion to censor some viewers or some speakers and not others, I think that plainly violates the First Amendment. And I think that's essentially the thrust of this Court's decision in the Manhattan Community uh, cable case against Halleck, which is that in this area, looking for state action is absolutely critical. There are things that the, if the government does is a First Amendment problem, and if a private speaker does, we recognize that as protected activity. Mr. Clement, so, you, oh, can you um, give me one example of a case in which we have said the First Amendment protects the right to censor? So I don't know that the court used that particular locution, Justice Thomas, but I think that is the thrust of Hurley. That is the thrust of PG&E. That is the thrust of Tornillo. In all of those cases, a private party did not want to convey and disseminate the speech of a third party. And in every case, the government said, no, we have some really good reason here why this private party has to disseminate the message of a third party. And uh, I've been fortunate or unfortunate to have been here for most of the development of the Internet. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the argument under Section 230 has been that you're merely a conduit, which it exact, that was the case that back in the 90s and perhaps the early 2000s. Now you're saying that you are engaged in editorial discretion and expressive conduct. Doesn't that seem to undermine your Section 230 arguments? With respect, Justice Thomas, I mean, obviously you were here for all of it. I wasn't here for all of it. But my understanding is that my clients have consistently taken the position that they are not mere conduits. And Congress, in passing Section 230, looked at some common law cases that basically said, well, if you're just a pure conduit, that means that you're free from liability. But if you start becoming a publisher by keeping some bad conduct out, 
content out, then you no longer have that common law liability protection. And as I understand 230, the whole point of it was to encourage websites and other regulated parties to essentially uh, exercise editorial discretion, to keep some of that bad stuff out of there. And as a result, what Congress said is they didn't say, and you're still a conduit if you do that. No, it said you shouldn't be treated as a publisher because Congress recognized that what my clients were doing would, in another context, look like publishing, which would come with the kind of traditional defamation liability, and they wanted to protect them against that precisely to encourage them to take down some of the bad material that if these laws go into effect, we'd be forced to convey on our websites.